If you go outside, you don't have to go hiking into the Black Hills. You could feel it when you get that nice soft wind comes from the west. That's when you know you get in the springtime of the Black Hills. That's when the thunder comes back. They even have a ceremony. Some of the people went to what do we call Black Elk's Peak. And they welcome the thunder every year they go up there. So I want to thank those people as well because uh, that's how we, we fight uh, the various uh, problems of our people to come for the summer, the droughts, all that. It starts there at Black Elk's Peak when the thunders return. Also, we remember our relatives. This is kind of a hard time last few years. I know myself, I've been going to about 17 funerals already this year. I lost my oldest relative on my dad's side. His name was uh, Warren Means. He lived in Montana. So then I was realizing when I was coming home, now I'm the oldest on my dad's side. So uh, I guess I... Recording in progress. Yeah, who was that? He said, <laughs> somebody snuck in, he said. <laughs> I tell, some of you probably know that. Notice, he said, uh, kind of give me mean looks because I don't take off my hat usually. I learned that from one of the old chiefs. His name was Fool's Crow. I noticed he never took off his hat, so I asked my uncle, Matthew. I said, how come Fool's Crow, he don't take off his hat? Well, he said, that comes from being in mission school. We had to get up and down. Every time the priest goes like that, we get up, and next thing we got to sit down. Then pretty soon, the, I thought, you got a genuflect. He said he, he didn't like that. So just as a, a way of showing our people our identity, he says the hat, the waposhta, that's part of your personality, he said. And uh, those uh, protocols, our rules, our manners, our, we don't have to take off our hat because he said uh, back in uh, 18, I think it was uh, 60, 1862, somewhere around in there. That's whenever we, uh, it's coming up now, celebration of uh, what do we call greasy grass. He said we counted coup on uh, Custer. So a lot of our men started wearing hats after that, but they took them from the army. And uh, that's why I don't take off my hat. I salute those warriors that took on Custer. So when he told me that, then it was kind of a two-way you know, it's a kind of a protest against the protocols of the church, but also uh, remembering those great warriors that took on the United States Army on uh, June 25th. That's coming up. And uh, so that was the uh, reason why you don't see me either. Most time I don't stand up, but sometimes good song, you know, you have to stand up and uh, get your feet moving a little bit. But uh, it's kind of a silent way of recognizing our, uh, our history. I learned that from Fusco. And uh, that's the reason why I do that. But I want to uh, say on the behalf of all those people, we had many struggles here in the Black Hills. Someone mentioned, my nephew mentioned Wounded Knee. I was... Uh, I was 71 days, we went toe to toe with the United States government, right? Down the trail here at Wounded Knee. Every day we woke up in Wounded Knee, we had a ceremony for all those 300 men, women, and children that were killed there in 1890. And we go back every year now since 1973. This was our 50 year anniversary 
So a lot of us that came to Wounded Knee, they're no longer with, with us. But they made a sacrifice, like Buddy Lamont. He's still over there. He's in a grave, him and his mother, his relatives. But he gave his life on behalf of this treaty, these Black Hills. Those are things we used to talk about in Wounded Knee. We had some great teachers that give us the oral history of our people. And uh, so that's one of the reasons that it means so much to us that we even had a camp in the Black Hills called Yellow Thunder Camp. It was established in February 1982, 1981, and somewhere in there. And we tried to use United States law uh, to establish our camp or cultural center. That was the original dream. And the old folks came up there to support us, Fools Crow and the chiefs of that time, Matthew, Kills Enemy, Iron Cloud, a lot of those guys came there and said, we support you because we didn't have no guns or rifles that time. We just wanted to use our right to our culture, our human rights to have our culture. So we established that. A lot of things happened right after the Wounded Knee, and you're going to hear from report from United Nations. We had a great conference up there in, in uh, Standing Rock, 1974, established the International Indian Treaty Council because the at that time, the Hukpapas, they had a long, they had a good vision that they supported uh, what happened in Wounded Knee. They invited us up for an international conference, first one in this part of the country. We had over 3,000 delegates from various countries of the whole hemisphere, all the way from tip of South America to northern tip of Alaska. And uh, we began to work in international community on a daily basis. And Fool's Crow told us, because I went to see him, I said, uh, I got chosen to be one of the people to go to the United Nations. And I said, uh, I want to get your advice. He says, well, he said, you know, we used to have a United Nations a long time ago. He said it was a place called Pipestone, Pipestone, Minnesota now. He said, we used to gather there, all the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakotas. And we decide where we're going to hunt, where we're going to do certain things, ceremonial ways, where we're going to have a sun dance, where we're going to have these different ceremonies. And uh, to that, it goes back a long time. He said, we had a United Nations here on the prairie, here in the Black Hills. And so... Since the Black Hills is a home of our creation, this is a hard time we have to convince the Christianity people that we too have a creation story. We too have a beginning. We're star people. We come from the stars. So they say when our people die, like all these people that's passing on, that's where they go. They go up in the stars and, uh, our people meet them up there, take them around. So when you go out in the beautiful summer night, you see those stars shining. That's where your relatives are, with the star people, where we come from. But we end up coming down to Wind Cave, and Wind Cave is right in the Black Hills. So that's why it means so much to us. It's our place of creation. Not many people could say that. Hardly no Americans, they don't know where they come from, but we know. That's why we love this land here. That's why it's not for sale. We can't sell who we are. We can't sell our identity. And that's the spirit that we try to continue. The Black Hills is not for sale for the simple reason. It's where our nation began. It's where our humanity was recognized by Tokashila. It's where we became Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota. So these are things we got to remember, the very basics. And those of you in here, that's why you're here, because you know those stories. 
they pass them on to you because you have that feeling, that attachment, that medicine comes from the Black Hills. Pretty soon we're going to be some dancing. And so uh, I want to pray for them as well and to remember them, give them strength because that helps us to continue as Lakotas is to continue those very, very sacred ceremonies. And that's where you learn a lot of things about our history, about our culture. Uh, we don't want, we don't like to have tourists there because they like to take pictures and uh, those type of things. And so we don't like those distractions because we're there to pray. We're not there to take pictures or have a remembrance later on. But yet you remember by experiencing the beautiful sun dance not by taking pictures. So unless you dance, unless you attended, prayed with the people, then that's a memory will last forever. As well as you learn how to pray, you learn how to communicate with Tokashila, with the great mystery. And so on behalf of the people here of the Black Hills, we welcome each and every one of you. And remember those things that our elders teach us about this land is not for sale. You're going to hear about it. All oh, the gold mining. Here, the gold miners came back. Okay, they're here again. They didn't learn their lesson. So anyways, that's what happened to Custer. He liked to, he's the one that brought the gold miners first time. So how many Custers we got now? A lot of them. So I don't know if they're going to learn their lesson or we have to teach them again. But somehow the people is going to stand on behalf of the Black Hills because that's where we come from. That's our creation story. We didn't come across the Bering Straits. We call that the BS theory, Bering Straits. And so uh, we've always been here. So remember that. This is our home. It's not for sale. And we're fighting every day to get to return. And so on behalf of all those people struggling, all the people that's doing their ceremonial ways this summer, Oh, okay, next, uh, we're gonna have some uh, individuals here with their in the, uh, own own opinions uh, and they're going to share that and the way they do. I'd like to first call uh, um, uh, Tyler Yellowboy, Oglala Tribal Council. Oglala Sioux. Oglala Tribal Council. Following him, we have Sid Bailey, uh, Steve Brave, and Keith Ryder. And we have these two gentlemen up here. So, open the mirrors up again, or the, they'll close with a wax. Open the address for the tribal council representatives that are here. <clears throat> uh, good morning. Tyler Yellowboy, Machiapi. Uh, current council representative for the Ogallo Sioux tribe, I'm serving my second term. I have want to first off, I want to say welcome to each and every one of you. Um, I've attended some of the treaty meetings um, to learn. I'm a young council representative, and as our chairman earlier stated, I'm Lakota first before I swore an oath to the IRA way of doing things for our tribal government. And I had a lot of good teachers in growing up. And one of them was uh, Mal Lonehill, Chief Mal Lonehill. And he was very vocal on a lot of issues that dealt with our lands. He was a past tribal vice chairman of our tribe. And I believe I saw his daughter um, logged in today. 
and I and I bring him up because there's a lot of issues in regarding land and what Mr. Means talked about not selling our black hills. You know, that's something that at the last treaty meeting when we had here, Mr. Eagle had a very good conversation. And that's one thing that I've told him as a young council representative, that's something that we need to stand up for is our treaty rights and standing on the stance that, you know, our land is not for sale. Because I know <clears throat> a lot of us young people are learning. And I call myself young because I, I, I consider myself still learning. You know, a lot of knowledge is in this room today. A lot of wisdom. Each and every one of us has an idea and a thought. And so I'm not here to showboat or grandstand. I'm here to listen and learn and observe. Because that's my role. Because eventually I'm going to be sitting like my Lexi Richard back there. My Uncle Rick. And so a lot of these meetings are, I'm glad they're being recorded and I'm glad that people can take part virtually that can't be here. Because we have to remind our government, the federal government, and I do that. I, when I go to D.C., I make sure that our people are always at that table. And we are not forgotten. And there was something shared with me before I uh, quit, because I was told I can't campaign up here. <laughs> but there was something that was shared with me, and, and, I'm, and it stuck with me, was... We come from a people that had to survive. We had to come from an age where we fought to live. And our non-native people don't have to worry about our future generation, their future generations, because they are always here. They came overseas and they invaded our lands and they put us on these little tiny reserves, reservations. But our people fought and our prayers were strong because today we're still here and we're still strong and we're still fighting for our land and our rights. So with that, welcome and I, I'm here to listen, I'm here to learn and uh, have a good rest of your day today. Thank you. Tyler Yellowboy. Hello. Hello. Lakota Tribal Council. Sid Bailey, Standing Rock Tribal Council. They're next. On deck is Steve Brave, Sichangu Tribal Council. And in the dugout, we have Keith Ryder. Good morning to all of you. My name is Sydney Bailey. I represent uh, the Long Soldier District uh, Tribal Council for uh, Standing Rock. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, you guys might know it as the Fort Yates, uh, the town of Fort Yates, the Fort Yates District. But um, it's it's a. Uh, you know, you get on council and you get picked out of the crowd to come up here and and speak. And it's it's it, uh, you know this is what you signed up for, I guess. But. You know, uh, just listening to uh, Tyler and the rest of them, you know, I, I, you know, it's it's good to see you guys all here. And it's uh, I've uh, since I've got on console, just like Tyler was saying, is that you know I have to listen, I have to listen and uh, take it all in and 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 go ahead and come up with a, a comment or, or or so forth. But uh, it's. Uh, it's a learning process that we we have to do because uh, this is new to me. I was a uh, I was a wildland firefighter for like twenty three years, and uh, I went all over the place. Uh, and uh, soon after that, I became the the Buffalo manager for Standing Rock, and uh, you know it's a, a very difficult job at that too. You know, but uh, I've uh, 
my first treaty meeting that I came down to here, down here to Rapid City to the Black Hills is that, you know, uh, I wanted to learn and uh, I get to sit here and listen. So I haven't ever since I've been on tribal council, I've, I've made it here so that I can, I can listen and I can learn. Um, I, I agree with uh, Tyler and Bill Means and, and so forth that, you know, the, the Black Hills is, is so sacred to us and uh, uh, we, we can never accept the money and, and so forth. But uh, on, the, on the flip side of that is that uh, we need to start educating on our treaties. Uh, we need to start reaching out more and uh, and educating them. I, I, I hear some some of the, the younger people and uh, they're you know they're uh, they're oosh, so they they, they want to that they're looking for some some assistance out there, and it, sometimes that pops into their mind. But you know uh, we need to, we need to educate them more as far as you know why we don't settle. And uh, Bill Means is. Uh, he uh, gave a, a great example of why we don't settle. And uh, I've listened to others that also say, say that, you know, if we ever were to settle, we're okay with them committing fraud against us, you know? So um, I believe that, you know, we, we need to educate our younger generation more. You know, we have uh, social media out there and uh, a lot of them are on there is, is, you know, what can be put on social media to help us educate them? If it if it be the 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 Black Hill settlement, our treaties, uh, docket seventy four, and so forth, uh, there's a, there's a there's a lot out there that you know. Uh, I I believe that if we start educating in such a way to uh, get it out to the people and uh, get them active, more active in in our in our concerns and our fights, I I believe they would you know this room right here would be filled. They would they would try to make it down here. Um, you know, uh, it it makes it difficult for them to get to places like this to participate in in, in gatherings like this. And uh, there's a lot on uh, Standing Rock that would just love to come here. They would be here and they would, uh, you know, uh, they would participate. Uh, they would be vocal, but uh, they they don't have the opportunity to to travel. So uh, I I think that you know. Can we use social media to, to to educate them? So, you know, there are some of the things that run through my head and, and so forth is that uh, our, they're our future. So we got to invest in them. We have to invest in them in, in, in any way. And the most, the best way is to educate them on our, our treaties and our, our, uh, our ceremonies and, and, and so forth. But uh, you, you see, the younger generation that go around and they, they have their head down and they're going through their phone, you know, how, how do how do we how do we uh, get their attention to, so we can educate them? Uh, I I, uh, it, I sat here and I, I got a list. I got a chance to listen to everybody, and um, you know, even when I was a, a young boy, uh, my family they were active in uh, in, in in our ceremonies. And uh, when it came time for me and my brother to, to, to learn our language, we were learning it from my grandmother because she was our babysitter. And, uh, you know, really good stories that... Uh, They're, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, but um, they're good stories that um, we've lost because, uh, you know, we were young and we we didn't know how important them, them stories were to us. So um, as <clears throat> on, on the other side, she was trying to teach us our, the, our language and she was uh, teaching us in a feminine way and she finally quit. She said, no, you need to learn from a, the, the male version. 
So she, she quit. And, you know, I, me and my brother, we lost out on it. My sisters now, they speak it. They know all of our songs. And, but, you know, we, once, once we, we stopped speaking that our, our language, you know, it was like uh, we lost interest. You know, we, we got involved in sports and so forth. So, you know, uh, I think that uh, through educating our, our youth is, is, is something that we, we, need to, we need to invest in. So, uh, with that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you. Once again, forgive me, and um, I hope you guys all have a good time here today and stuff. So, thank you. Thank you, Sid Bailey. Steve. Steve Brave. Are you here? You're next. All these, all these uh, personal addresses are important. They have teachings and so listen to them. On about the base. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Steve Brave. I'm council representative for Butte Creek uh, Community. In case you don't know where that's at, it's in uh, Wood, South Dakota area. And the uh, population there is about 68. So if you drive through there, don't blink. Uh, like they say, you'll probably miss it. And uh, first of all, I'd like to wish you uh, a good morning. I'd like to wish you safe travels. I hope you enjoy your stay while you're here in the hills. For those of you who uh, reside here in the hills, you're very lucky. It's a beautiful place to, to live. It's a beautiful place to be. Like one of the uh, former speakers said, it gives you a spiritual enlightenment. Ever since I, uh, I, li I lived here for a while back in the 80s, a couple, about a year or two. And uh, I really had, I really enjoyed my time here. Unfortunately, I had to go back to school and then I had to go back to the reservation to, to find employment. But uh, listening to all these speakers speak, it brings me back to different times in the past several years, decade. When I'd come to the hills with my family, I tell my family that I feel like I'm home. I feel, I feel like I'm where I should be where I'm supposed to be, where our people should be. And with that, my family had taken a, a keen interest in coming to the hills all the time ever since then. After my children grew up, they started coming to the hills more often. And I do my best to try to tell them some of the history that I knew of the hills. Not the history from the books I've read in school, the things I've learned in the classroom, but the history that was passed on from people like you, my relatives, from my family, my grandmother, my mother. And I often hear individuals when they speak talk about their grandmothers. I too was raised by my grandmother. There was many, many nights when she'd uh, when she was putting me to bed, she'd tell me stories about how it was back in, in the day. And, uh, and they were all very interesting. They stuck with me throughout the years. I was the type of individual where I, when I lived with my grandmother in a log cabin down by the river, or my grandmothers, they had log cabins down there and they took care of all the, all the grandchildren. And all of us, Grandchildren, we weren't like cousins, uh, nieces, nephews, that type of thing. We were all like brothers and sisters. We all lived together. We all ate together. When evening would come, in the morning, they'd feed us breakfast and turn us loose. We'd go spend the entire day uh, 
navigating the, the river, living off of uh, wild fruit. In the evenings, our grandmothers had a trick. They cooked on wood stoves. And during the summer months, they'd cook on the wood stove. They'd move the uh, wood stoves outside. And to uh, they attracted us, or they got us home by cooking these wonderful traditional meals uh, in the evening. And you can set, smell it all the way down the river. And boy, we'd, uh, we'd get home real quick. And with that, I'd like to share a little uh, conversation I used to have with my mother before she passed. And there was times when I'd have to, in her end years, I'd have to uh, transport her back and forth to her uh, medical appointments in, in Butte Creek. I call it Butte Creek because uh, that is our community and uh, uh, the Washichus established a township of wood. So I call it my home, Butte Creek. And I tried to teach my children to do the same. And as we were going back and forth from the, from the hospital to, to home, uh, she'd say, take a look out here. At one time, these were all Indian homes. There was even teepees. We even had our own powwows and everything out here. And uh, now, it is owned by non-Indians. And so that got me to think, how did this happen? When at one time, our relatives lived and owned these lands. And to this day, I'm still, I'm still looking into it. I, I once said on council, we really need to take a look back and see how some of these lands left our care. How did they get into the hands of the Washichu? And that's th something that I'm still going to push for because I think it's very important. And it's important uh, for the treaties. And when I first came on tribal council, we'd read a lot of contracts and in those contracts was a, a lot of times was a, a phrase in there where they say, wave, you will wave sovereign immunity. And this is something that I fought against uh, ever since I've been on council. And why would we have to wave our sovereign immunity and go to especially state court to settle our differences. And so we say, no, we're not gonna approve this contract unless they remove this clause and agree to go through our tribal courts because our tribal courts are just as good as the state courts. And so this happens over and over again and it's still happening today. And uh, so we'll, when you sign contracts with these big corporations, and even small ones, read the fine lines. Read it well, because in a lot of them, they'll have that clause in there, especially when you're doing a contract, let's say for like construction or, or something to that effect. But getting back to the treaties, I often heard growing up, uh, different in individuals, mostly adults, saying Dok Shah, Black Hills. And it didn't ring a bell back then. I thought it was a, a, you know, a regular joke that they use all the time, which they did, a lot of them did. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard it in the past. But until I got older and started getting involved in our tribe, in our culture, in our heritage, I started realizing a lot of things. The, the county I grew up in was a, uh, a, a racial county. And so I grew up surrounded by uh, that type of behavior. And so I didn't know any difference. 
Uh, and when I moved out of the area and moved to a, a larger town, it was the same thing. It was right in the middle of our reservation. Mainly controlled, most of the business is owned by the Washiju. And uh, as, as children and as teenagers, uh, they really, uh, they really treated us, uh, uh, us bad, like second class citizens. And so later on in years, I said, oh, I'm going to try to make a good life for myself, no matter how the world is. And I start seeing things and I start learning about our, our, our heritage, our culture, our traditions. I don't know at all. I'm still learning. I'm still seeking. But I do know this, that we need to focus on our treaties. We need to make the general public, the entire country aware of what had actually happened to our people and to our lands. I still meet people today who think we are totally integrated into the society, that we had done, forgotten about our heritage, our culture, our religion, our language. And standing here today, being amongst all of you, that is definitely not the truth, not the truth. But it's important for us as leaders, mothers, fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers, aunts and uncles, and even to the younger generation who are knowledgeable in, in, in our culture and our, our identity, to share with others, to cut down that wall of ignorance, that perception that we are still those Indians on those old Western movies, television shows. I have always, I've tried to encourage Phil. I said, we have the social media. I said, what we need to do, I didn't say it in these exact terms maybe, but what we need to do is get out as much information about our history, our culture, but most importantly, our treaties. Because some people out there still have that perception that we're taking handouts. But we are a treaty tribe. We are entitled to everything that we have coming to us. Now, once again, I'd like to thank you all for your interest and all the work that you have put in, put into our making the world know who we really are and also our own families, our own communities. Well, one thing I'd like to express while I have the opportunity, all too often in, in, my, in my life, in tribal government, community gov governments, and just so social life on, on the reservations, and throughout the country is this great division that keeps holding us back. I once said on tribal council, I said, I told them that we were discussing a topic and I said, that's a, that's a white man's conception. I said, we as a Lakota, I said, we share everything in common. That's how we were, that's how we survived. And today, I would like to encourage everyone to put their differences aside in order to move ahead, to achieve great things for our people and our future generations. We must put the division ahead. We must unite as tribes as a people like we did in the past. And we were very, very 
successful at it. We survived in a good way on our own lands. So once again, thank you. Have a great day. Oh, hello. We'll stay a little. That was Steve Brave. Okay. From Tatanka Nanjing, East Rider. Oh, my dog, Yepi. Oh. Oh, better when we did him here. When I had a lot of energy, when I had a lot of Today, I come to express and, and share some uh, of what the issues that we have and what we're doing in Canada as a, a Dakota nation from Standing Buffalo First Nation in Saskatchewan. Um, we came today, I, we came with our, our uh, council men and women from our community. Our chief wasn't able to come, make it to make it here. So he sent us as representatives to share some of the concerns, some of the things that we're doing as a Dakota nation. We're, uh, we're the descendants of the Sisitawan and the Wachpetawan. And uh, we've been chased into Canada. And then now, that we have a reservation, a reserve. We're one of the few bands in Canada that never signed a treaty. And today we're fighting that, you know, around the issues of, of sovereignty, you know, the land, our water rights, in Canada, we, we call them riparian water rights. And what does that mean? You know, the, the, the Canadian government, they put a duty to consult with all First Nations that have treaties, and they haven't done that. They haven't been consulting us a lot of things, a lot of issues. So today, you know, we're, we're, we're fighting that. Today, we're, we have, uh, we're, uh, we're fighting our, with land claim. And as re recently, you know, we've come and we've, we've met with, our Lakshi Orville and and a lot of the people here. We've met we've met over the winter. We've come down to Lower Brewer, Sisseton, and in Canada we met in in Brandon and in in two months ago we we had a gathering in our territory. Or Orville and and some of the, uh, the people are look she here Harold came and spoke to us about what spiritual law is what natural law is and the laws of the Chinupa the natural laws that we're supposed to be govern ourselves by. And in doing that, and we had 
Orville come and, and, and sign a declaration for us as Tatanka Naji that we still exist under those pipe laws. We still exist under those natural laws. And from that, now the, the Canadian government, the House of Parliament in, in Canada are going to have a formal apology, right? A formal apology to the Dakota and Lakota in Canada for what you know they've done to us to this point in time. And so that opens the doors for a lot of things with a formal apology and with our land claim and with our push for sovereignty. You know, we, and not signing a treaty, way back as far as the War of 1876, the Wars of 1812, where in Canada the British battled against the French for our country. So our ancestors, they signed a, a peace treaty way back then. And they didn't honor that. And that's what they're going to apologize for. You know, it's saying that we're immigrants, that, that we don't belong in that land. You know, in all of history and all the research, you know, our our people, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, lived in this territory from the Northwest Territory all the way down to, you know, down into Florida. This was all our, our territory. And now we're, that we're fighting to recognize that the government in Canada is recognizing that that was always our territory as Dakota. You know, we were pushed back there by the, the, the American cavalry chased us into Canada. Our relatives from Sisitouan and Wachpetouan were, you know, we were chased into Canada. So uh, standing Buffalo, went to Fort Carlton in what is now Manitoba, where the, the fort was. And he told them, you know, we want land for our, our people like you promised. So they came and, and surveyed land, a big plot of land for our, our Dakota people and a fishing station. And they, they didn't honor those those treaties. So they, uh, you know, the land that we have now was, is land that was never surrendered. We never surrendered that land. So we're fighting land claims to get compensated for that land. And then writing what true sovereignty really is. You know, with the land, with the water rights. So all of that is, is happening today. Next month in June, the, the Canadian government is going to say a formal apology to the Dakota in, in Canada. And then from with our, our, our land claim and what we're fighting for, you know, we're, we're not only fighting for the land that we have, but we're fighting for, you know, the, the international rights we have here in Canada and, and here in the United States. You know, because there's that medicine line shouldn't mean anything. And so we're, we're, we're fighting for international rights you know, as Dakota, Lakota, Nakota across this whole territory. And what does that mean? We're here today 
tomorrow, this weekend, this week, to share some concerns, learn, listen to what we all have to say, you know, and join in, 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 in the common issues that we have, because we're all one people, you know, we're of Dakota, Lakota, Nakota ancestry, and we're, we're the ones that got to work together now to make some things work for us, to make some things happen. And then in closing, I'd like to acknowledge this part here, this Chanupa, the sacredness that we have. We still have this. And I thank my kudas for the prayers, the songs that go with all of this. It binds us, it connects who we are, you know, in here, because without this part, you know, we wouldn't have very much. So with ceremony, I know there's lots and lots of ceremony that we have. And if we share those, you know, and, and, and continue to pray, pray with one another, for one another, these young, young ones here, they're the ones that are going to benefit from the struggles and the fights that we're doing today. So with that, again, I say wopida, wopila for this part. Pidama, matakyas. Ho, oh, oh. ho. Okay, uh, relatives. Uh, my, uh, the coordinators of this uh, summit here have... Uh, said uh, they were going to authorize a 10-minute uh, break, but I disagreed. Gosh. <laughs> so um, I guess uh, we're going to have a song, and then after the song, we'll go into a 10-minute break. So drum group, you have been instructed as to sing a real good uh Inner tribal song. And terminology of domination, which is um, something whereby people are deprived of their free existence, then that creates a reality. So the there. <laughs> Uh, uh, something in the record, historical record called Arcana Imperii, which is the secret empire. And the language of the secret empire is what I've been studying for, for decades, among other things. And so when I wrote uh, my book, Pagans and the Promised Land, decoding the doctrine of Christian discovery, I was attempting to communicate a lot of that underlying code and the terminology and the Vatican papal documents of the 15th century that were issued by various popes in Rome. And when I quote those, I generally quote them and quote them in English, but I also have some of the Latin language that I can quote as well. And that's pretty crucial. So for example, in the Vatican papal document of, of uh, 1452, Pope Nicholas V, tells the king of Portugal, King Alfonso, to go to the western coast of Africa and to invade, capture, vanquish, and subdue. Those are all terms of domination. All Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ, the use of the word enemies indicates that they're uh, at war with non-Christians. Reduce them to perpetual slavery and take away all their possessions and property. So that's a paradigm or a patterning of domination. And that was repeated over and over again. Those documents of the 15th century from maybe we could go to 1436 all the way to 1514, uh, four of them at least in 1493. And we can see those same patterns, those same type of patterns. So for example, Pope Alexander VI, after Columbus or Cristobal Colon uh, sailed from the Iberian Peninsula to the Bahamas and back, the Pope at that time, Alexander VI, issued a document that talked about propagating the Christian empire. 
uh, our con the uh, uh, impurity Christiani propagationum to propagate the Christian empire. And then he talks about reducing the barbarous nations. So when we go deep into this English language and find these patterns and then trace those documents and many other such documents, they trace right into the US federal Indian law and policy system. So for example, this year, 2023, is the 200 year mark since the Johnson versus McIntosh ruling of 1823 was issued by a unanimous Supreme Court. And what most people don't realize is that that particular document, which is the cornerstone of US federal Indian law is a tra traceable right back to these Vatican documents and the language and behaviors of domination that I'm referring to. So once we understand this, then we can realize that we can oppose that on the basis, that system of domination on the basis of our traditional knowledge and wisdom, on the basis of our traditional teachings and understandings. And I do that by talking, first of all, about a number of principles. So for example, first in time, first in right. Well, that's certainly not the people that come across the ocean by ship. And by the way, when I lay out that contrast between the free and independent existence and the system of domination brought by ship, that also suggests a view from the shore looking out at that ship, uh, the viewpoint of our ancestors and the view of the people on the ship coming toward our ancestors. So that's an important part of the context as well. And so that Vatican papal tradition of domination is traceable right into the federal Indian law and policy system. When people go into law school and they internalize into their minds and into their nervous systems, all of those meanings that are found in those, um, for example, US case law issued by the Supreme Court, which is traceable back to other Christian European thinkers of the past. And then these people who become attorneys apply all these non-native ideas to our nations and peoples to me they're just pulling the strands tighter and tighter and the the, the knots are are becoming even more uh, steadfast you might say so uh that's why it's so crucial to have our traditional uh languages and our traditional systems that's why they attacked our languages in a campaign of linguicide the intentional killing of our languages through the so-called boarding schools, which were not schools at all, and uh, residential schools, which were also indoctrination centers in a genocidal effort to destroy any national consciousness that our young people might have as they grow to adulthood. So we are, many of us are survivors of residential or boarding schools, uh, but also some of us are the descendants of the survivors of boarding school. So my, my grandpa, uh, Bushyhead Spybuck Newcomb, and his father, Solomon Newcomb, they were both at Haskell and um, ended up there. And when my grandpa Bush ran away, when he was 15, they put AWOL on his file because it was a military uh, indoctrination center. In any case, the, we started a campaign, as I mentioned, whereby we were calling upon Pope John Paul II to formally revoke the Intercetera Papal Bull of May 4th, 1493, as representative of, of all of those series of papal documents. And we've been maintaining that came, campaign ever since and uh, working with m more and more people over the years to uh, establish that uh, campaign and in a very steadfast manner so that the Vatican would have to come to terms with their record. You know, the Vatican today has, according to one estimate, uh, 177 million acres of land across the globe. How much of that is in the Western Hemisphere and how much of that is on the basis of these papal documents that I'm talking about? Now, I mentioned that first principle, first in time, first in right. But the second principle is uh, void when initiated. You cannot grant what you don't possess. 
void ab initio, nemo dare quod non abit in Latin. And what that means is that when they issued those Vatican papal documents, in my mind, they were null and void because they had no jurisdiction across an entire ocean to impose anything on anyone, let alone a whole system of domination. But yet they purported or pretended to have such authority granted to them by the Bible and by that whole tradition uh, of, of, their, of their campaign of a religious empire. And then the third one is anything that's wrong from the beginning can never be made right because it was wrong from its inception. So this entire idea that they have a right of domination, I call that the claim of a right of domination over everyone and everything. They can claim it all they want, but they, it doesn't even exist. It's just something they made up. And Chief Justice John Marshall in the Johnson versus McIntosh ruling admits this because he talks about the extravagant pretension of converting the discovery of an inhabited country into conquest. Well, conquest is another word for domination. So they're pretending to have the right to convert their so-called discovery of this uh, entire part of the planet into a, a right of domination. And that's what we're challenging. So this is a uh, very important information. And we've had many, many meetings over the years with the Vatican officials. And we've written numerous letters and, and uh, documents uh, to educate them about their own history. As I said to Archbishop Silvano Tomasi in 2016, when we some of us met with the Pope and with uh, other Vatican officials, I said to him with respect, I believe there's much of your own history you don't know. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever actually read the papal bulls? And he said, uh, no, I must confess. And I said, well, that's okay, but I've been reading those documents in Latin and English since 1989. So I think I know a little something about them. And then I elaborated on that information. The uh, reason why this is so critically important as information, in my view, is because even prior to the treaties, we have our free and independent existence, as I had already stated. And to me, that's really the significant point, that whatever claims the United States or Canada or these other uh, systems of domination are claiming against our nations and peoples are invalid and illegitimate. And so that's um, the main point that I, or at least one main point that I want to get across. I heard earlier a mention of land claims. Well, how in the hell can our peoples and nations have claims to that which is ours? Those people that came by ship are the ones with the claims, not, not our nations and peoples. And so this is the way in which their language tricks the mind into understanding things that, that aren't true. And um, that's even a contradiction there to say understanding things that are not true. Well, we can have the understanding, but that doesn't mean that it's accurate. Let me give you an example. In Vine Deloria's book, God is Red, uh, he cites to another book called Red Man's Land, White Man's Law uh, by Wilcom Washburn, who was one of the historians of the Smithsonian. And he has a section in here on the Indian Claims Commission, which, by the way, was based upon the Johnson versus McIntosh ruling of 1823. And he says in here that the white man's law uh, was designed to deliberately destroy the independence of the native nations. And he talks about a uh, payment of monies, $5 million paid out in 1944, not according to the England Indian Claims Commission, but a prior uh, jurisdictional act uh, for partial compensation for the failure to ratify 18 treaties that were made in 1851 and 1852. But here's the, there's the interesting thing. He says, partial satisfaction of the Senate's failure in 1852 to ratify 18 treaties made with these tribes. It should say nations because nations, nations enter into treaties. Under the treaties, 
the Indians ceded 75 million acres in return for which they were promised such and such. Well, how in the heck can you cede anything by means of a treaty that was never completed and never ratified? It's an impossibility. Yet this historian of the Smithsonian put something that is absolutely 100% incorrect, inaccurate, and false, and deceptive in my mind, and tr prints it as if it's fact. And the average person won't be able to see through this. So going to the Vatican statement of March 30th uh, of this year, they made a, um, a press release and they said that they were repudiating the doctrine of discovery. It would be a much longer conversation to get into uh, than we have time for today. But I have developed a 17 page response with some links to various documents, which I will make available to Phil and the organizer so that it can be made available and put out there far and wide. We'll also be posting it to our website, originalfreenations.com, and you'll be able to access it there, along with our documentary movie, The Doctrine of Discovery, Unmasking the Domination Code, directed by Sheldon Wolfchild, a movie that is based upon my uh, um, book and my body of research over the years. The thing is that the Vatican has made uh, various statements in in their press release that are factually inaccurate, and um, uh, they've got a, quite a number of errors in there, um, such as making the claim that the Vatican papal documents of 1493 were overturned by a um, Papal Bull of 1537. That's not correct either because the, the ecclesiastical penalties from that 1537 Papal Bull Sublimus Deus were actually revoked by the Pope under pressure from Emperor Charles V. And also the um, document itself, according to certain scholars, was revoked. Um, so, so the thing that I want to get across here is that this is part of a much, much longer conversation. But I also want to say that I've had the good fortune to work with Joe Day Gowdy, who was the chairman of the Yakima Nation for quite a number of years. And he studied and applied himself to learn about this information by reading my book. We had numerous conversations over the years and he was able to begin working with his council and we worked together to assist the council to really get up to speed with this kind of information. And at the end of a process of quite a number of years, the council felt confident enough to actually uh, file an amicus brief in the US Supreme Court. And um, he had hired and trained a number of, a couple of attorneys, young attorneys that, that uh, could be educated. And that legal brief was filed with the Supreme Court in a case, uh, the Cougar Den case, which had to do with travel and trade based upon their 1855 treaty. And they did win that case, but I can't claim that it was won on the basis of the amicus brief. But what the amicus brief did for the first time in the history of federal Indian law and policy was to challenge before the Supreme Court, the doctrine of Christian discovery and domination, dehumanization, genocide, and that entire record that I've been talking about here. So that is quite remarkable. I also work with uh, Peter Dorico, who taught legal studies at University of Massachusetts at Amherst for 30 years. And he's written a book called Federal Anti-Indian Law, The Legal Entrapment of Indigenous Peoples. It just came out this past fall. So Joe Day, some uh, time ago, he created something called redthought.org. And we've had, I guess, about 70 hours or something of conversations that have been recorded and put together in a way that people can go to as a resource and learn from. And so I just want to make people aware of the fact that that exists. And um, I um, want to say that it's a much longer conversation that will continue with regard to the Vatican and so forth and um, how this overall system of domination that I'm talking about uh, can be actually challenged. 
And um, I think that it's so crucial that we do that on the basis of our traditional languages and cultures and spiritual spirituality. And so um, um, I don't want to go too long. I know you're a bit behind on time, so perhaps I'll just leave it there. There's so much more that I could talk about, but I've tried to distill it down uh, pretty concisely here today. And uh, so, uh, Wopila, thank you very much, Wanishi, in our Lenape language. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's a great honor to be with you here today. Wopila, thank you, Steve. Steve, this is Justin Puyer. Um, I yeah. have a question <clears throat> for some type of support from the from this body from this Ocheti Shakoi, how would we how would we go about that? Do we do we write one letter or do we get a number of letters from all the other from all the constituents here? Well, uh, I, that would be up to up to uh, you to decide what you think would be best. I know I did assist the Great Plains Travel Chairman's Association, if that's what it's called. I, uh, certain I think that is um, to go ahead and create a resolution back when Standing Rock was happening and uh, that was adopted unanimously I think Chairman Archambault wasn't there because he was on the ground but in any case that's been done there's many different uh, documents that have been created over the years I'd be more than happy to assist with any of that drafting if you if you uh, care to have that kind of assistance and um but I think that uh, individual letters are certainly uh, important. And also, as a, uh, if, if there was any kind of a document that the um, treaty councils could put together and submit to the, to the Vatican or wherever, that would be great, too. I also think that it's important to begin to direct the efforts toward toward the Supreme Court. You know, I had an opportunity to talk with Justice Antonin Scalia back in, I think it was August of 2005 or 2000. No, it was August of 2006. And it was shocking. Either he just was lying right to my face or he claimed he'd never heard of the doctrine of discovery or the, the uh, Johnson versus McIntosh ruling, which was strange. And then later, he the Supreme Court arranged for Lindsay Robertson, who published the book Conquest by Law, to go to the Supreme Court and give them a briefing on the Johnson versus McIntosh ruling. I had written a one page thank you letter to Justice Scalia, and then I put footnotes with sources, or not footnotes, just little uh, ways of sourcing the information throughout the letter, showing book titles and page numbers and so forth. And then I sent that with a copy of my 1993 law review article published at New York University School of Law called The Evidence of Christian Nationalism and Federal Indian Law. So I think that that had some influence on the court. We have to educate these people. Um, there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of inaccuracies that are being perpetuated um, that, that need to be uh, corrected. So I hope that's helpful to you. And, and lastly, I want to say also that I mentioned the uh, Red Thought and, and Joe Day and Peter Drico, because we do have the ability to assist any councils or what have you. Who, who um, would like to save the question? Any other question, comments? I'd be happy to, I don't know if you have time for that, but if you do, yeah. fine. Oh, that's fine. Steve, um, one thing I wanted to mention to everybody here, you know, that last year, the Oglala Sioux Tribal President at the time, Kevin Killer, wrote a letter and we hand delivered it to the uh, Jesuit general by the name of Sosa. Great. He, he was at the meeting down at Red Cloud and then he went to, I think he went to Rosebud the week after, or the day after. But we did, you know, we did hand him a letter asking them to re repudiate the doctrine of discovery. And so when they sent out that statement, it seemed like that wasn't strong enough for, for everybody in general. So 
So what me and uh, Phil was talking about and other people, like how do we, how do we ask for more of that? Because you know, this, it seems like they put, they open the door just a little bit, but now we need to, as you said, you know, take it to, take it to the courts. But how do we really put some teeth into this action that the Pope had started? I well, think that the um, uh, getting specific with them. See, here's the problem. When we started our campaign, we talked about the re revoking the actual papal document, one of those documents as representative of the series. So now, you know, our, our statement is revoke the papal bulls, plural bulls, papal documents. And what happened over time was that certain people took the issue and made it Re repudiate the doctrine of discovery. Well, the doctrine of discovery is a way of thinking. And it's very difficult to say, you know, you can say, oh, I disagree with that way of thinking, but we want it, we're gonna renew and maintain our call for them to revoke the actual documents that have resulted in so much devastation and destruction around the planet. And by the way, this is much more comprehensive than our original nations and peoples because it really is about the claim of a right of domination having been made into the organizing principle of the planet, which is destroying so many ecosystems and, and life systems around the planet. So to me, that's what I'm calling for is an end to that claim of a right of domination as an organizing principle uh, on the planet. And okay. that can be supported. That sounds great. Yeah, that'll be that. I guess, you know, for the room, everybody listening, I think that would be our next plan of attack is to demand revoking the Papa Bulls next. So, you know, we'll be uh, putting that out with our own, like with, with the Black Hills Sioux Nation Council for Pine Ridge. And, you know, thanks. I would like everybody else to take that back and work on your own with your tribes. So thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you. I very much appreciate the time. Any more questions? I think you're good, Steve Wopila. Oh, love you. Got a question? Hold on, we'll get you a mic. It's on. It's my favorite. <laughs> okay, I uh. I wanted to bring up that some years back, Alex White Plume was on radio and he talked at some meetings about Papal Bull at that time. And he knew quite a bit about it. And at the time, uh, we, oh, this is the truth. Honestly, nobody knew nothing about it. Nothing. And they'd ask, what is it? What is it? And he would try to explain it to him. But the, the majority were uh, like Catholics. And uh, it had to do with the Vatican and the Pope. And um, they didn't want to hear it. But uh, he, it was very interesting. And I think what you should do now is possibly contact Alex. And he'll come back with it. But it was very interesting for those of us who weren't Catholics. So, you know, it's, it's, it's something that uh, uh, it's going to have to hit the majority of the reservation concerning the natives, concerning them. That's how this papal bull came about by the by Rome. Yeah, That's thank you for that. You, you know, we have there's a, a healer, traditional healer way up north in Yellowknife, Bessa Blondin, and she's been using our documentary movie to educate people up there and along with her healing uh, practices and uh, she's actually been able to take people that have been down and out with drugs and alcohol and assist them to turn their whole lives around on the basis of what they learn in that movie. Because finally, they're understanding more comprehensively why they're in the predicament that they're in, why the people are in the predicament that they're in. And so to me, you know, we talked a lot about intergenerational trauma, and that's absolutely correct. I, I know that firsthand. However, we do have also intergenerational wisdom and intergenerational knowledge, which I mentioned previously, and we have to rely upon that strength to be able to move forward. So thank you very much for your, 
for your comment about Alex. Appreciate that very much. And Tui, thank you for that advice. I'll reach out to Lexi and see what see if we can get some research done back home on that. Okay. All right, Steve. Okay, Wopila. Uh huh, Wopila. Okay, good afternoon again. Uh, ha, ha, ha. We're gonna uh, we're gonna have a meal prayer and then we're gonna get our food and have a working lunch because uh, we're behind on our uh, agenda. Well, I'm not, but these guys are. <laughs> so. Uh, We'll do it that way, I guess. I disagreed again, but uh, they will rule me. Oh, ha, hech a tuk telo, hokea, eh, woite, wocek, yon sin, kaka pina, hoi, hon, hekta, kya, wol, yon kap, hey, chuhan, wan si, wogala king telo, o hech a li, le, won spea, yu chanku, tchun, egna kapi kilena. We're uh, gathering some a spirit plate, and then uh, we'll ask uh, Lexi Albert if you could do that as soon as they bring it in. Well, in the meantime, there is a situation on the Rosebud and Pine Ridge law enforcement. One of the wild Oglalas went over to Rosebud and was messing around with uh, Auntie. And uh, Auntie called the cops. So they chased him. And the cops were about ready to catch up to him when when he passed the, the tribal boundaries and came back into wild Oglala territory. And uh, that cop slowed down and he stopped. So another cop pulled up behind him. He, he said, uh, "I thought I thought you had him." No, he said. He was too fast. You were right behind him, he said. Well, it's a, they're one hour ahead, so he really took off, he said. <laughs> Thank you. He'll be here all day. <laughs> well, I'll check you out for Oh, yeah. I can't let you will check your time. You watch him up, it's out. I watch you get a word ticket, and now you have a chunk of a big deal. I hold to Gashua, I said, I can't to go to Katia drop off, got up, I said. Would you mark a hitch or a pick later, and wait to enter you have my hino, you can't hit a or a pick you let it, word ticket, let it to get your step out to Gashua, I can't to go to it. It's a way out to get a big hit, it's a dead chapter, it's a Tonight, 
Kaku Hiki Oyati, Oksa Hinazium Kilanaho, you yours Agia, his Tim Kinazi Pistelo, a whole with me talking about it. Pastel, Opilata. Thank you for the prayer. As soon as you get to go ahead, we'll have you line up. Uh, child line is elderly first. No, no, I better quit making rules. <laughs> Robert's rule. <laughs> the, the meal is served like it was this morning for breakfast. So, um, however you guys worked it out this morning, but it's already out there. So we'll take a minute for everybody to get their plates. And, uh, thank you. Ivan's going out to his car to get his hubcap for Watetra. Okay, I'm uh, I, I'm a powwow announce, announcer, and before that, I used to uh, announce uh, softball tournaments and different things like that. So I have a disclaimer: anything I say is unofficial. So there. Oh, me talk you. Hello, and I feel bogolakin pillow. Me talk you. So they were saying a pill, choose papillo. They are better kile, takuma, you walk like a catcher. It checks your cute takapu. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, shake your hands with a good heart. My name is Phil Tuigo. I'm the executive director of the Chichanko Lakota Treaty Council. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a very uh, uh, tough uh, topic today. Uh, my topic is the role of the treaty councils versus uh, Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, some of you that don't know what uh, Stockholm Syndrome is, um, it's in 1973, um, the, there was a bank robbery in uh, Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, uh, Stockholm, uh, Sweden. And uh, during during that time, after it was over, the uh, the hostages um, began sympathizing with their captors, the bank robbers. So I, I'm relating that story into what's happening today in uh, in IRA governments and uh, traditional uh, governments. Um, this uh, map the um, Makoche Kile Ehani um Hatranka ki Oyanka. This is the um William T. Hornady 1889 map that's showing the area in which the um bison roamed. I'm gonna show you some maps real quick. Here's um one of our relatives from uh, Canada um mentioned um uh, that um the territory, the, our, I, I, I call it our ancestor homelands of the Ocheti Shakoni, <clears throat> goes from the East Coast all the way up into Canada. Uh, I'm still working on this map. Uh, it should go further west into the um, Grand Tetons and uh, Colorado Rockies, and possibly further south, where there was a battle between the Lakota and the Comanche on one of the uh, winter counts that was recorded. So this is a um, work in progress. Here's the uh, um, 1851 uh, treaty map. This map was uh, um, made for us by uh, um, Dr. Uh, Joseph Robertson uh, of Matho Ohitika Analytics. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, point out that uh, According to the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty, the uh, the boundaries of that go, starts from the, to me, uh, if you look at the description in the 1851 treaty, it starts from the Missouri River and ends at the Missouri River. That's where the original uh, boundaries was. So here's some uh, waterways and aquifers. Um, it's hard to see with all the um, lines and things, but and the land sessions from the 1868 treaty. 
I wanted, I wanted you to, uh, to look at that straight line at the bottom uh, lower right where that um, you see the uh, Nebraska on the, on the east, the northeast corner of Nebraska. And that's that's what they call the Royce line. Um, sometime after uh, 1851 treaty was made, um, remember they, they didn't have any maps uh, at that time, the treaties were signed. So somewhere along the way, I, I can't remember the um, treaty that was signed by a few of the Lakota chiefs that uh, gave away that corner of that, um, our treaty boundaries, 1851 treaty boundaries. And Andy Reid probably knows that one. So here's a, a maps that was used from the Indian Claims Commission. And you'll see that on the left side is the 1851, and you'll see that uh, straight line at the bottom, that's the Royce line. And you also have the uh, 1868 treaty map on the right side. And then this is a, a map of uh, um, the Ocheti Shakoyan, distribution of the Ocheti Shakoyan where all of our uh, uh, relatives are located and uh, some of is this not complete? I think some of the the sites are missing, so we'll keep working on that. And uh, I might end up getting fired after this presentation, but I hope I, I might need uh, support letters from you after I'm done with this. So <laughs> some of you are, with all due respect to uh, IRA tribal government, uh, I want you to remember that. Um, through, throughout time and history that the um, traditional Lakota government existed uh, way before the IRA Act of uh, 1934. <clears throat> I don't know if uh, my nephew is going to be able to back me up, but he's on tribal council. Dwight sitting over there. Uh, I want to acknowledge my uh, Sichangu relatives that are here. And um, we have some council, Steve Rave, uh, maybe Steve can provide me a support letter after my presentation. Uh, um, the uh, traditional Lakota government is not federally recognized. And uh, some things happened over the last couple of years. Uh, we had um, Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, come to the Black Hills. But uh, the treaty people... Um, we're not allowed to talk with her. Um, the, the the bottom line is the federal government only would speak with the IRA um, tribal representatives. So we 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 need to uh, think about that. So the way the uh, IRA tribal government is uh, trouble <laughs> trouble go <laughs> tribal government is uh, set up. You have a president. Um, you have a tribal council. And you have committees, you have districts and communities. And of course, um, the IRA likes to, uh, they can't make decisions with their attorneys, right? You have an army of attorneys, uh, it costs a lot of money. So uh, you have an IRA constitution uh, that was uh, started in 1934. This is 1934 is when the IRA history started. So you have to remember that. Um, how that went and uh, back in time was there's a man named John Collier came to the all the reservations with a I believe a template constitution and uh, I guess they wanted the um, you know even then they had plans to um, break up the Great Sioux Reservation and and uh, by by uh, the um, tribal governments, the um, Lakota people uh, voted on accepting the uh, constitu their constitutions, their IRA tribal constitutions. <clears throat> and back then, you had um, the what they called the old dealers and the new dealers. And so the old dealers was these traditional Lakota people, the traditional Lakota government. So from then on, um, I don't know if you realize it or not, but um, IRA constitution, constitutional tribal governments uh, are considered uh, Section 17 federal corporations. And 
they they are uh, what the treaty people uh, consider the IRA government as extensions of the federal government. But you know, uh, I think we can still use that to our advantage. Um, but um, they they are considered federally recognized tribes, and then um, they receive federal funds from the United States government. And I guess um, they uh, operate with a golden rule that says, he who has the money rules. So that's that's how it's running right now. Um, they're right at the IRA constitutions are in English. So um, there's no uh, room for Lakota language in there. And then uh, there's there, and if you look in the IRA constitution, you'll see that they're limited to the 1889 act boundaries. So the IRA government uh, uh, has uh, full jurisdiction within the, their, their uh, county line, I guess. Uh, they work closely with the Secretary of Interior. And some of these constitutions have uh, uh, per approval of the Secretary of the Interior and, or, or Commissioner of Indian Affairs into the constitutions. So anything that they do, any action that they take has to go, they have to send a copy up to the Secretary of Interior for approval. And that's what we call the uh, federal uh, wards uh, government of the government, wards of the government, like, uh, like children are wards of the you know, state. You have uh, <clears throat> the uh, IRA government takes trips to Washington DC to, uh, I guess, ask for more money and things like that. Uh, tribal governments operate under a law and order code. And um, this is where it starts to, uh, you know, turn into uh, uh, the Stockholm Syndrome. Is the, a lot of the, the laws that have been accepted on the reservation are modeled after the state laws. So, and then you have, um, these, those are Washitu laws then you have policies that are Washitu policies that they operate under. Uh, you remember there's a federal corporation, they have to operate under some policies and most mostly all of it probably written by um, in English, you know, after uh, Washitu policies. They operate under uh, Robert's Rules of Order, which is uh, different from the um, traditional uh, Omanichie, Lakota Omanichie protocol. So they are considered, again, extensions of the federal government. Uh, their emphasis is Western uh, Washitu education. You have to have a college degree at times. Uh, they have uh, plenary power. They, are, they exercise plenary power over the tribal members. Uh, they are also a resource uh, distribution center. So all the federal funding that comes from the uh, um, federal government is distributed with through these tribal program services. And uh, it's sometimes they have separation of powers. Uh, so if they want to let go of some of that power, they'll delegate it uh, to uh, different areas. So there, you have a delegation of authorities, you have an executive branch, you have a legislative branch uh, and a judicial branch, and then tribes can charter entities they, like at home, we have uh, St. Francis Indian School, we have uh, St. Teguska University, we have our housing. Those are all chartered entities. And they have a ready workforce of a thousand employees, at least for Roosevelt, close to that. Uh, I don't know, I haven't seen the budget yet, but the IRA handles a $100 million budget. Um, I don't know exactly, but but um, what's happening, and we have to face this, is assimilation, colonization, uh, Christianity leading to the Stockholm Syndrome that's happening on the reservation today. So then on the other side is uh, uh, the uh, traditional Lakota government is not federally recognized. Uh, they don't wanna hear us in Washington DC or they don't, uh, when, the Secretary of Interior comes to town, she don't listen to us. So we'd like the uh, IRA government to, uh, they allow them to go in the meeting room 
So we give them a piece of paper and here, these, here's our uh, concerns. Can you, um, can you uh, relay those to the sector of interior? Uh, we tried that. So you have the um, traditional government, you have the Oyate is you, the Wichashi Atapika and Wakichuze are the, um, the chiefs. Uh, um, we have the Oshpaye, which is their leader is the Itchacha. You have the Tioshpaye, which is the Nacha. And you have the Tiwahe, which is the uh, Ate. We have the Lakota, we have Lakowichocha, are those ways of life, ways of Lakota ways, uh, going back for thousands of years. We have the Ptehincha, Songwi, Chanupa, uh, the seven ceremonies, and uh, the teachings. Um, we have Lakowichocha, and we have Lakota Wokhe. Um, right now, um, we, we're talking about creating a Lakota um, customary law, ceremonial law, and, uh, uh, you know, to address some things that are going on. You might have looked in the news and uh, you'll see uh, fake medicine men, fake chiefs uh, abusing our uh, ceremonial ways. Uh, as far as I know, that Ptehicha uh, Sony has instructed us to take care of the Chanupa. So why do we turn around and give it to a non-member to run our ceremonies? We, we, uh, I don't think that's what she meant when she brought the Chanupa to us and to uh, take care of it. And we turn around and hand it over to the non-Indians. Uh, that's something that needs to be, it's a sensitive item that needs to be discussed. Um, some of, uh, in speaking with uh, some of our uh, spiritual leaders, they would like to have a, um, a meeting to address those concerns. We have individuals that are um, um, violating uh, women and children, and we need to address those uh, um, immediately. So we have the, um, our, these are our inherent sovereignty is our Lakota Iapi. It, to me, the Lakota language is uh, very important to our sovereignty, and we have to hold on to that. That's who we are. That's what the language we use to communicate with our ancestors, with the spirits. Um, then we have the treaty councils. The treaty councils uh, organized themselves after the 1851-1868 treaty, treaties and uh, what they wanted to do was to uh, make sure the United States government um, honors the uh, treaties that were signed. So that's where the, the um, treaty councils come from. And those were the chiefs that signed the treaties. Somehow we jumped from uh, being the traditional government uh, that was uh, acknowledged in the treaties by the federal government because they signed the treaties, our chiefs, those are your grandpa, your your Tukashila, that went to Fort Laramie and signed a treaty. And somehow when uh, 1934 came along, uh, the traditional Lakota government got pushed aside and somehow we're no longer valid, uh, but to, we're still here. We're still here. Uh, we've been here since the beginning of time. Uh, we don't have no funding. The treaty councils are, have no funding. And, but they can form themselves. They, they uh, don't need no tribal council approval. They don't need no resolution or ordinance. They've been here before the IRA government. So that's why um, they have inherent powers, but they don't have any funding. So, um, so that's why the treaty councils is looking towards the IRA government and uh, with a request to open a treaty office on every reservation so that we can address these uh, treaty uh, depredations. The treaty depredations that are happening are the, the uh, um, mining in the Black Hills, for instance. You have uh, uranium mining, you have gold mining, uh, gold exploration, um, oil and gas around the Black Hills west towards Wyoming, uh, um, pipelines, uh, that's, that's on the treaty territory. Uh, again, chiefs is our chiefs, our grandfathers, 
They signed the treaties with the Chanupa. They sealed it with the Chanupa. Those are your grandpa, your grandfathers that signed a treaty with the Chanupa. So the treaty councils operate under that uh, seal, that seal, the Chanupa, uh, the teachings. So that's why we, we have our um, one of our pipes here to uh, honor that uh, commitment. It's very sacred to us. The, the work that we do is very sacred and um, we're, we have to watch our behavior. Uh, we have to live by the customary law and uh, that's very important to us. Um, <clears throat> remember all of this territory that each reservation is on was originally the Great Sioux Indian Reservation that was made by the treaties. Um, those are also our ancestral homelands. And we also had the Kichita societies. Um, we, we were not just a bunch of uh, wild Indians running around on the Great Plains. We had a very sophisticated uh, structure, a tribal uh, traditional Lakota uh, government. Uh, and uh, we have Omanicha protocols. This morning, you went through a very important, uh, beautiful ceremony with the Chanupa. Those are very important to us. Um, elders play a very important role in the, in the traditional Lakota government. Uh, Unchi and Gaka, that, that's you. You're very important in this uh, pro, uh, traditional Lakota government. We have women's roles. Um, we have men's roles. And even the children are, have roles. They're, they're very important in the traditional Lakota government. Uh, we have Wakan Chasha. We have Wapie Wichasha, uh, we have Pizuta Wichasha that work within within these uh, uh, this way of life. Uh, we have um, Lakota Wonspe and Woksape. So it's nice that you have a, a college degree, but also that's only half of it. Maybe, maybe, maybe half. The other half is your Lakota education. That's your language, your history and your culture, that's very important. Um, you have the rites of passage. Uh, one of those examples is um, when uh, your son, uh, his voice starts changing, then uh, it's time to start thinking about hambalecha for him so that he can find, find out what his journey is so that he can uh, go on the hambalecha. And when he comes down from hambalecha, he might have a dream he might have a vision. He might be a medicine man. He might be, a, he has a role. He has a um, vision. So those are, we need to get back to that. Um, I don't know. It seems like uh, we're losing uh, our culture in that way. I don't see too many young men going on a vision quest. We have the protection of the ceremonies and the sacred sites to think about. Um, what are the protocols to those sacred sites? Um, we have a ceremony, uh, ceremonial calendar that we need to um, implement year after year. It's been going on for thousands of years. But those have to be uh, implemented. Um, we have, and, and now uh, traditional knowledge is very important today. Uh, as you may know, many of our uh, um, treaty elders have took the journey. So now it's up to the next generation to learn all of these things. And we, uh, we don't have any employees, but, but we live it. We live this way of life. We're not an employee. So that, those are the two forms of government that uh, we have a dual government that exists today. And it's up to the uh, our leaders to uh, um, share share these uh, roles, so that um, we can uh, together we can build a, a future for our future generations. The um, <clears throat> purpose of the Treaty Council is to protect the future generations from colonial rule and occupation by the Milahanska. Uh, which has subjected the Oyate of the Confederate uh, Ocheti Shakoni council fires, as, uh, as the Washichu call us, the Great Sioux Nation, to 
genocide, cultural genocide, ethnic cleansing, forced assimilation, theft of our territory, lands, natural resources, and waters, and other extreme crimes against humanity that threaten the survival of the Oyate. We have the seven laws that guide us. What's Chanto is uh, gener generosity to carry the welfare of the people. We have Wonshila to have pity and compassion for all things that move. Wayoniha is to honor and respect your fellow man. Wachitanka is a patience and tolerance. Wahwala uh, is to seek humility. Wohitika uh, is, is to be brave and courageous to have these high principles. And, and, to, and when you implement all these laws, and uh, there's not just the seven, there's more. There's uh, woksape, you'll reach uh, wisdom. And uh, I'm gonna skip over this. Um, we had a, a talks of the, um, the uh, doctor and discovery. And I'm gonna just skip over those because uh, I only have 15 minutes. I have, actually I have a hundred slides on this. I don't think I can, go through all of them in uh, 30 minutes. Uh, only James could do that, James Rattlingly. He's a good talker. So. Uh, remember, um, inherent rights is a tribal sovereignty, is the inherent right or power of tribes to self-govern within the borders of the US with certain established federal limitations. This is a, um, if you Google inherent rights, this is what you'll get. The constitution and federal laws grant to tribal nations i don't think they grant that to us we we have that it's within it's in our blood it's within our very existence for thousands of years but uh, what's what's powerful is uh, honey which uh, is uh, what we have been doing since the beginning of time that's that's our power not the ira government but who we are uh, you that the, who you are and what's in your blood the, the language, the history and culture, and where you uh, where our territory is, They'll, those are inherent right. So treaty councils play a very important role um, to renew the sacred relationships of the Oyate and Uchimaka, empower our people to fulfill our obligation to care for and protect Uchimaka and all our relatives that reside upon her, to unite our, our strength as confederate nations of Ocheti Shakoin, Oyate in the spirit of Wolakota to maintain peace, security within our Tiwaya, Tioshpaye, Oshpaye, and Oyate, to preserve and fully restore the inherent sovereignty and power of the Chanupa and the sacred institutions and ways of the Oshpaye and Oyate for the dignity, health, and well being of, of our people, to uh, preserve and protect the sacred ceremonies. Uh, not interested in the citizenship. Uh, we are the Ocheti Shakoi Oyate, we are the Teton. Um, you have to remember that the uh, Milahanska is an empire, a successor, imperial and colonial state successor to the unlawful colonial invasions, occupation and rule of England, France, Spain, Spain and Russia over hundreds of sovereign First Nations of Keawita and Unlawful, and then unlawful colonizer or occupier and ruler of itself of those and other First Nations. The Ocheti Shakoe Oyate existed as a fully separate sovereign and independent and equal nation before and after the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, by which the Mila Hanska purchased from the, uh, France its interest in territory encompassing the territory of lands. The Louisiana um, Purchase of 1803 brought into the United States about 828,000 square miles of territory from pr France, thereby doubling the size of the Young Republic, what was known at the time as a Louisiana territory stretch from Miss Mississippi River in the east to the Rocky Mountains and the west from the Gulf of Mexico and the south to the Canadian border to the north, uh, part or all of 15 states were eventually created. That's the Louisiana Purchase. So I'm going to jump over to uh, to to the uh, 
topic at hand, what's happening to our people. You have to excuse me. Uh, Take a quick breath. The, um, <clears throat> by the chartering of the IRA governments under federal Indian law of the Milahaska, the colonial power attempts to replace the sovereign nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the colonial government, government relationship and uses native nations and leaders unknowingly or unwilling as de facto agents of Milahaska in the colonial rule over exploitation of and assimilation of native nations and people and their natural resources and waters. The coerced and uninformed, uh, uninformed adoption of IRA governments and constitutions by the reservations created by the act of March 3rd, 1889, further undermined Oyate unity and solidified both the territorial and legal di diminishment and fracturing of the Ocheti Shakoin Oyate, its sovereignty, its peoples, and its Wolokota spirit and culture in gross violation of the inherent sovereignty of the Oyate and by virtually all of the collective and individual human rights recognized as possessed by peoples and and uh, under the international law of the Washichu for their survival and well-being. Um, here's the Stockholm Syndrome again. Stockholm Syndrome is named for a bank robbery in Stockholm, Sweden in 1973. Four people were held, stopped, uh, by, held hostage by the robbers for six days, when they were rescued, the hostages attempted to protect the perpetrators with whom they had an amicable relationship. Um, Stockholm Syndrome describes the psychological condition of a victim who identifies with and uh, uh, empathizes with their captor or abuser and their goal. Uh, the dictionary, Webster, uh, Merriam Webster's dictionary the psychological tendency of a hostage to bond with identity with or sympathize with his or her uh, captor. <clears throat> Here's some things uh, that are signs of Stockholm syndrome on the res. Um, Lakota language, history, and culture is not important. Oftentimes, uh, if you speak Lakota back home and uh, somebody gets offended, that's Stockholm syndrome. You're contracting um, these federal dollars to non-Lakota companies, that's Stockholm Syndrome. Leasing land, your lands to the non-Lakota or Washichu, and uh, that's Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, where does your tribe put the money that the federal government sends you? And a Washichu bank, the white man's bank, that's Stockholm Syndrome. Employee hiring, you're hiring uh, Washichu uh, tribal jobs. Uh, you got to think about this. Western education is all above everything, uh, above all else. And so the Lakota education is no longer important. Um, Lakota traditional knowledge is not important. All you have to do is go home and look at your tribal budget. Is there anything for Lakota language in there? Is there anything for the treaty councils? No. I know this because... Uh, Rosebud's the only one that has a, a, a small budget for the treaty council. So I just wanted to bring these out so that um, you can go home and encourage your tribal council to um, look, we're coming up on a new budget um, cycle is to, uh, I would ask the treaty councils to uh, submit a budget to your tribal council and ask them to uh, fund the, the, the treaty councils, open an office hire an executive director, because we there's, the Washiches are back in the Black Hills. We have uh, mining going on. We need to do something about that. And later on, you're going to get some more information on that. Um, this, this is also um, called uh, trauma bonding. The term trauma bonding is also known as Stockholm Syndrome. It describes a deep bond which forms between victim and their abuser. Victims of abuse often develop a strong sense of loyalty towards their, their abuser. 
despite the fact that the bond is damaging to them. So here's a treaty council submitted a budget to the tribal council. They get denied, but the next day they fund the dog pound or they give themselves a raise. That's what we're up against. And uh, the, the treaty elders are our elders. Um, they, they, they deserve the respect. They've been here long before us and we need to support them. And I ask, I'm asking uh, all of you to support your treaty councils. They want to they uh, attack these uh, doctor and discovery, challenge the doctor and discovery and to um, um, go on the um, attack to uh, remove the, the uh, um, miners from the Black Hills. Um, the Sichon who submitted a letter to the um, President Biden asking um, them to uh, remove the Black Hills from the Mining Act. And we all need to do that we, we, so we can keep the uh, uh, mine, uh, the Black Hills sacred. To, for uh, the next thing you know, they're going to be having a mountaintop, uh, mountaintop mining. If that happens, that means they're going to remove the tops of these mountains and level this whole place. And I thought this place was sac sacred to us. It is sacred to us. But um, this is all going towards um, genocide. Um, there's only have a couple minutes left. Uh, what must we do to uh, move forward? Uh, remember Tehin Chasomi's instructions and teachings. She came to us as a, at a very difficult time in our life, in, uh, in our history, when our, our people was starving, there was famine in the land. And she came to our people with this gift and told us to, what to do. She gave us instructions on what to do. We must keep that very important. We must abide by those. Stop giving away our ceremony um, to um, non-Indians. Don't let them run those ceremonies. Take care of the fire yourself. Take care of these sacred items yourself. Don't hand it to nobody else. Do it yourself. Fund the treaty councils will be a good start. We want to organize the Ocheti Shakoi, work with the treaty councils, return to the, your Lakota way, fully support and fund the Lakota language, history, and culture. Right now, we're at a point of uh, almost the language being extinct. So um, all of a sudden, our young relatives here, I see it's nice to see some young relatives here they have to pick up the language in order to save our people, in order to save our sovereignty. You have to learn your language. Um, parents, grandparents, speak Lakota to your children. Speak it all the time, everywhere, you know, any place, any time, speak it to the children so they can communicate with you after we're gone, so they can communicate with us when we're gone in the language. Um, to unite the spirit of Wolakota as an organization of dedicated members of the Sichangu Oshpaye, or this is for the Sichangu, uh, of the Lakota Oyate and the Confrere Ocheti Shakwin Oyate. Break the bonds of colonial rule and unite and restore the full sovereignty and Wolakota of the Confederate Oyate of Ocheti Shakwin under Oyate on Wolkhe. It's time to start drafting our uh, Wolkhe to leave. Um, since the Lakota language is almost extinct, now we have to write down these wopche to for the next generation so that they don't forget Tehincha Sony's instructions. So um, demand and the honor to demand the honor respect of, by Mila Haska of the Ocheti Shakon Iate as an independent sovereign confederate nation. Demand the full enforcement of all treaties made by Mila Haska with the Ocheti Shakon Oyate and its Oshpaya, according to the Wobche of the Oyate International Law of Treaties Between Nations. Um, we, have treat, we have these treaties uh, in place. Those are international law. They're, um, 
guaranteed, it says in there, uh, Article 6 of the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty states that the United States pledges to work with the chiefs and successors. Those are the treaty councils. Those are the chiefs. They're in the treaty. And uh, we want the, uh, we are asking the IRA to open up your mind and uh, fund, fund these treaty councils. We, we, need, we need the funding to operate so that while you're having your elections every two years or three years, the treaty council is always gonna be there. If you hire, hire an executive director, he becomes very, uh, becomes an expert at negotiating with the federal government and he becomes uh, knowledgeable of the federal process and all the federal processes and he will overwatch the treaty uh, territory for you while you're having your election. And then when you get elected, he will give you orientation and uh, uh, um, training, a workshop on what our treaty rights are. And there's a continuum. Some of our treaty council members have been in place for many, many years. And some of, a lot of them have left us now. And so now we have uh, our elders today. And um, this quite possibly could be the last generation of Lakota speakers. You have to uh, use them. You have to work with them. You got to ask for their help. So uh, I'm going to end right there um, before I get fired. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you very much. Any questions? I think all the IRA guys walked out, huh? OK, grab a microphone. Use your microphone. Yes, you talked about land and you talked about um, control. Okay, I'm from the Red Shirt Table area on the reservation and right a uh, couple miles from west, east of my house is the National Park. South Unit, it's called, and it's Indian land. And uh, the um, U.S. government has a park that's north unit cedar pass and that that's that's the land that they took and they they're enforcing their their uh, their uh, businesses and stuff on it but now they're after that land that's tribal tribal land and it's uh um it's 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 a land that they say they can use i think the tribe said they could use it way back in dick wilson days and that was what 47 years ago they have not once done a thing with it they haven't put nothing not a trailhead not even a trash can out there instead they put a gate and they put a phone a lock on it that's national park doing that and we go back to the tribe over it frank knows about it our tribal president and we council people know about it but it seems like there are uh, i don't know frank is new in there and he's he's really vocal and He's outstanding, so we're expecting things from him. But the past council have been really like they're timid, and they haven't none of, none of them ever stepped forward and said, "That's our land now. We're going to take it back." And it was made with a MOA, a memorandum of agreement. Well, forty-seven years from now, that should be null and voided, and the tribe take that land back and give the land back to the. Native people that owned the land in there and the Air Force took it. During the war, they took it and used it as a bombing range. And to this day, there's live shells. There's even bombs out there. And, uh, <clears throat> but nobody, like nobody cares. And it's us at the local level that have to um, complain, watch, watch it. And we have, we have um, none members coming in. They're white people. And we see them, and they're friendly, and we talk with them, and they tell us what they're there for. They're honest. We're coming in after agates and uh, petrified wood, you know, and that ain't good. And we try to tell them that, that this is Indian land, and uh, you, but it's us talking. We don't, I'm not wearing a badge. Or I'm not carrying a gun. Otherwise, I probably could force them out of there. But no, 
It's just us. And we stop them and talk to them, tell them you can't do this. And yet uh, they just go right on down the road. So um, this is my daughter sitting next to me. So she's made phone calls, wrote letters, talked to Dusty Johnson and all of them. What can be done with the South Unit? We haven't gone anywhere. It's still there. Tomorrow, next year, it's still going to be laying there like that, bare. And then they want to come and put in the 1,000 buffalo in there. 1,000 buffalo, that just came up a month ago or so. And uh, uh, there's a, I don't know what the name of that group is, but it's coming out of Wombly and Kyle. And um, Thunder Valley wants to, to lease that land. Thunder Valley can't do that. They cannot do that. But the tribe let them. Now, here's another thing with the tribe. You talk about all this wrong that's going on. It's happened. It's it's um, just uh, it's 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 like uncontrollable. Now Thunder Valley has it, and that's that's a law. That's it's against them. But the tribe let them have it, and then they're talking about putting a thousand buffalo in that land, thirty three thousand acres, and you know, most of that is badlands. It's not prairie. There's not miles and miles of prairie in that. It's badlands. And there's hardly any water. And and um and they're gonna destroy it. The buffalo will come in and destroy the whole thing. And uh, it it just some of you talking about stuff like this. That's happening to us right now on the in the reservation. And it just taken maybe four, five people to band together and standing up, standing up to uh, these people coming in. And it's not our members. Our members go out there, they're going to be harassed by the tribal rangers. They'll be harassed by them. But do they go harass these non-members? No, like they're afraid of them. In fact, they were even threatened with the gunfight. They were, they were threatened by it by these people. So now you don't see nobody out there. And I don't know, this is supposed to be a federal government, a powerful of the tribal reservations, but it's not so, not in our area. And someday you're gonna hear something about it and you, you'll know what I'm talking about when these things happen. But uh, that's our land and that's what I'm talking about. Land is precious. There's a place on there called Blind Man, Blind Man Table. And relatives are still alive. <laughs> relatives. And they talk about going back on it. And they want to live up there. But is that possible? Could they go set up a teepee or whatever and camp there? Who's going to come and move them? You know, who's going to come and threaten them? This is for real. And so it's good you're talking about it. Maybe people out there be aware. Maybe there's some of our people on the reservation here. Maybe they'll be aware of it or they already should be. But I don't know about other reservations. I don't know about Standing Rock, Cheyenne Eagle Butte or even Rosebud. Us is land they're hanging on to to make a national park out of it and yet they themselves are afraid to venture on it so it's laying there vacant and the tribe is leasing it to non-members they're leasing it to cattle people their cattle run in it and there's even buffalo in it that belong to a rancher it's it's just not good and i'm glad you're talking about it Maybe more people will be aware that it is happening right now. Thank you. Ostello, any other question? Like Stimesla. Many, many Stimesla. Oh, Pilama, Pilam, Mitakas. GFL, before you. Sign out. Um, some people in the audience were asking for copies of your PowerPoint. You want to 
make it available, email it out or what? Yeah, I'll uh, make it available. Okay.